Well, good morning, everybody. I am glad to be here with you today. If you are watching this, it should be Sunday morning, maybe afternoon, uh, depending on when we're able to have you tune in to listen to this. Hopefully, we were able to have a great drive-in service here at Maranatha with Pastor Todd leading us in an Easter message. We'll be praying for that tonight. Hopefully, everything will go well, Lord willing, tomorrow. Well, again, I hope everyone is doing great at home, that you are staying well and healthy and enjoying this time that you have at home with your family. I hope you're able to get closer with your family, maybe to regain some of the things that we're not so comfortable in, in experiencing these days, having quiet time, having more time at home with our loved ones. Maybe you've been able to pick up some new hobbies or get into some old ones that you had to put down because you were so busy running around and doing everything. And see, even though this is a scary time and there's a lot going on, there's some beauty and some blessing in it as well. God has provided us with some time to reacquaint ourselves with being at home, with being with our loved ones. And I pray most of all that each and every one of you are investing more and more time each and every day into praying with God, and into getting into his word, to listening to what he has to say for you in your life. And uh, we'll just go ahead and get started here shortly today. I'd like to talk with you about a message that was given to me when I was in college. It's called the Basic Message of the Bible. And it is an awesome way to share what the Bible is all about with absolutely anybody. It is simple, it is straightforward, and the reason I'm giving you that today is because we're going to look at this with an object lesson incorporated and how Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the pivotal point of the whole basic message of the Bible, of the whole story of the Bible. The center is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now maybe you are watching this. It doesn't matter if you are an adult, a teen, a young person that's in our children's church services. This message has something in it for you, even if you know everything I'm going to cover and talk about. Maybe you've never heard it presented like this. And it's another tool you can put in your toolbox to take out with you when you're witnessing with someone, speaking with someone, that you can use to show them and, Lord willing, convict them of their need for Jesus Christ, of their need for a restored relationship with God. So let's go ahead and get started today. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, we, uh, we just pray for all of those that are affected with uh, sicknesses and, and the virus that is going around, Lord. I pray that you would give them healing, you would give them strength, you would give them courage through this time. And for the families of people that are dealing with that, Lord, I think uh, in, in addition to the, the physical um, ailments that are associated with this virus, the fear that has just stricken so many people is, is sad and it's a difficult thing to deal with, and Lord, you are the God of peace. I pray that you would give peace to these individuals that know you, Lord, that you would give them courage and strength in this time. Father, be with us today. Let this message resonate in our hearts. Let it challenge our minds. Help our young people to really, really grasp what the basic message of the Bible is. Father, we just thank you for the blessings you give us, for the opportunity to stand here today, to receive your word, to give your word. Lord, and in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, so the basic message of the Bible. Now you're going to notice as we go through this PowerPoint, Lord willing, it will advance. There it goes. There's going to be a lot of stick figures and drawings, and yes, every one of them is drawn with individual lines in PowerPoint. I did not do that. <laughs> this PowerPoint was a courtesy gift to me from one of my professors in college, Dr. Bird. Dr. Bird, if you're out there, thank you. Um, you definitely saved me. Many, many hours uh, of tedious clicking in PowerPoint, but it is awesome. It's such an effective way to convey the story of the Bible. It's got, I, I won't say everything because we can never capture everything that's in the Bible, but this is such a good basic understanding of what the Bible is trying to tell us. So the first slide here, we see us and God. Now the basic message of the Bible is this. God made us, the human family, to have a holy, loving relationship with him. That's it. God made us, humanity, to have a holy, set-apart, perfect, loving relationship with him as our creator, 
and our Father. And now you'll notice I talked about the object lesson earlier. We have a few things set up over here. One is this dish that my wife so graciously trusted me to bring here today. That is going to represent the world, the world God has made for us. I've got a penny. I'm sticking with using Abraham Lincoln for things, I guess. We've, we've used him a couple times now. We have a penny. That penny is going to represent you and me. This is mankind and God placing man into the world that he had made. He had made this world originally perfect. It was good. Everything he made, he saw that it was good. And he made man to place man in the good world that he had created, to keep it, to care for it, to have dominion over it. And for a time, we were in an uninterrupted, unbridled relationship with God. But God still had rules. And unfortunately, we broke that relationship with God by this thing called sin. Through Adam being disobedient to God's rules, sin entered the world. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 3.23 says it like this, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So even though Adam was the first to sin. Adam brought it into the world. None of us have an excuse. Every one of us have come short in the eyes of God in our lives. That is the first fundamental truth we have to accept for this to make sense. We all are guilty of sin. Now, to continue in the object lesson, what I have here is a cup. And this cup is full of what we're going to use to represent sin. So as Adam broke the rules of God, he introduced sin into this world. And as you can see, hopefully, the penny is inside of this sin. And it is completely consumed by it. It's surrounded by the sin. Everywhere it goes, that sin is there. And you can see on the graph that's on your screen here, us and God are now separated. And we see an application of that in Isaiah 59 too. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Romans 6.23, the wages of our sin is death. So you can see we have a separation between us and God. And in between us, there's this great gulf. There's this ravine, this canyon. And at the bottom of that canyon is death. Sin has separated us from God. And the wages of that sin is death. You know, in fact, if we die physically while being spiritually dead, we will forever be separated from God in a place called hell. So you can see that at the bottom of the screen, under that canyon that separates us from God. If we are to die physically and not have a relationship with God, not be spiritually renewed in our relationship with him, we're going to be separated from him forever. That is what hell is. It's being separated from God, having no way to get back to our father, our creator. That is the bad news of the Bible. There's nothing that we can do about it on our own. We are separated from God. We want to get back to him. We need to get back to him. But there's no way for us to jump this gap. Now, these aren't things that we like to talk about. They're not things that are encouraging or happy. But we can never ignore the fact that God tells us this is the way it is. This is the nature of humanity. This is the nature of reality. There is sin in the world, and it has separated you from me, people from God. But... Thankfully, the good news is that God loves us. God loves you and everybody in the world, and he does not want you to suffer hell as a punishment for sin. 1 John 4, 9 says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Now, in John 8, verse 12 says again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, 
but will have the light of life. So to add to our object lesson here, I have a candle. This candle is to represent the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And God sent Jesus Christ into the world from his throne in heaven down to the publicans and the sinners like you and me into sin, his son, so that we would have an avenue to be saved. First John, I'm sorry, John 1, 9 through 11 says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, meaning Israel. He came to God's chosen people, and his own people did not receive him. So his own people, some of them, called him a liar. They called him a blasphemer. They accused him of healing and casting out devils by devils. They didn't see who he was. They weren't ready to understand that this was the son of God. He is the promised Messiah of their father. So what did they do? They arrested him. By paying someone 30 pieces of silver, one of Jesus' followers, to betray him, they arrested him. They put him on a trial where they picked a, by all standards, terrible individual to be released over him. They beat him, they humiliated him, and then they nailed him to a cross to be crucified. One of the worst possible ways of death we can imagine. Effectively, what they did was they snuffed out the light of the world. They took Jesus' life on that cross. And now, hopefully, as you can see here, our object lesson is going to start taking shape. As the light of the world was extinguished, something the people did not understand and did not realize was going to happen. The people that were so consumed with him being a blasphemer, with him claiming these things that could not possibly be true, he was fulfilling prophecy that through him, the sin of the world was going to be placed on his shoulders. It was going to be soaked up around him so that we could effectively be removed from that sin. We would have an avenue. As you can see in the graph down below here, the cross that Jesus was crucified on fills the gap between us and God. It gives us a bridge back to him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Matthew 28, 6, he is not here, Jesus, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. What a powerful, amazing verse. So even though they were able to snuff out his life temporarily, it was not permanent. Just as Jesus said he was going to do, in three days, he was going to rise again. He did. And when they came looking for him, they say, he's not here. He is risen. John 1, 12 through 13 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God relit the light of the world so that we can now stand with him and not in sin. We can come back over into a relationship with God. Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and turn back that your sins can be blotted out, erased from the record book. Pastor was talking about this in his sermon. 
that we have a very extensive list of the things that we owe God for, for our sins. But Jesus comes along and offers to pay our bill, to erase everything that we're due from the book. And that's what he has done. That if we would repent, we would turn away from our sins. And in John 1.12, receive Christ into our hearts and lives, trusting him to forgive us. John 1.12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And you can see as we walk across the bridge of the cross, there will be a moment in time where we pass from death to life, where we cross the bridge from the world to God. And all we have to do to make that happen is to repent and believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We'll enter into a relationship with God, becoming a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, the new has come. We're made into something totally new. Jesus has worked in us, changed us. And in the end, all of those who are rejecting sin and trusting in Christ alone for salvation will go to heaven. The ultimate end for following Christ is spending eternity in heaven with God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To spend eternity in happy fellowship with them. That is the true basic message of the Bible. This is something so easy you can draw it out on a napkin. You don't have to remember every verse I mentioned. You have to remember the message, the story, to be able to tell somebody about it. Maybe this is the first time you've seen it laid out like that. Could I ask, where do you see yourself in this diagram? Are you on the God side? Are you on the left side, the world side, running away? Or are you at the edge of the cliff about to fall off? We're all somewhere on the spectrum. Where do you want to be? And then the last question I have for you today, young person, teen, adult, is there something that is keeping you from being on the side you want to be on? I'd like to ask everybody, join with me in prayer as we close today and really reflect today on what side of the bridge that Jesus Christ made for me am I on? Have I repented? Have I received him as my savior and crossed over, gotten away from sin and returned in my relationship to God? Or am I stuck? Am I stuck on the left side? Am I failing to cross over to have that relationship with story, restored? If that's where you are, reach out, talk with us. Find a trusted adult, older sibling, someone who knows, someone who is saved, and ask them, what do I need to do to be on the right side, to be back on the side with God, where I can spend eternity with him in fellowship in heaven. I pray all of you are thinking about that. I pray all of you spend time thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us because he loved us and does not want us to perish. He doesn't want us to suffer the wages of sin. Won't you join me in a word of prayer now? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the message you've given to us today. Thank you for your word. Father, most of all, thank you for the love that you have given to us. Lord, thank you for, even though we did not deserve it and we will never deserve it, you sacrificed your son to this world so that we could have an avenue to cross over sin and death back to you. Father, we thank you so much for it. God, I pray that you would work in the hearts and minds of everyone watching this video, everyone coming to the Easter service and listening to Pastor Todd's video that he did. Lord, just use your words to minister to people's hearts. I pray that there would be a great multitude of people that see this, 
and come to know you as a result of it, Lord, of the exposure to your word being the thing that convicts them that they need you in their life. Father, continue to be with all of us. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy. Lord, be with those that are struggling right now. Lift them up. Give them encouragement and strength. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody, very much. We will see you on Wednesday.